We were some of the first to discuss the power of print on demand before it got saturated with all these get rich quick schemes. So I felt like I really needed to shed the light in regards to what it actually takes to successfully scale your brand with this method. So if you're a new entrepreneur or perhaps you already have a product line established, I wanna discuss ways that you can successfully start with print on demand. And in this video, we're gonna dive into growth hacks as well as increasing your profit margins and some marketing techniques that will help you continue to build it for the long term. And I felt like I needed to start this video by picking the brains of Parker, who is the founder of Feet Socks. They, over the years, they sold millions of dollars worth of socks and they recently transitioned into a full e-commerce brand model um, after being featured on the Profit TV. And they did so with print on demand. So in this video, you guys are gonna get all the insight that you're gonna need to get started successfully. So if you're a new visitor to this channel, I highly encourage that you hit that subscribe button to be notified of the latest videos to help you build your brand and business from the ground up. In the beginning, like, like I said, we had no idea where or how we were going to sell. We had never built a business like this before. When we started, we thought we're going to sell into stores because that's what the other leading competitor does. So sell to stores. Like, to sell into stores, it takes whole infrastructure, you know, like seasonal catalog rotation, sales teams. So that's what we did and we were in stores and then came out here to LA because Taylor got hooked on Influencer. Before Influencer was really a thing, this is early 2016, we moved in this building in Hollywood. And in this building in Hollywood, it was, it was done with intention. In this building with Hollywood was every major like Vine and YouTube star in one building. So we're like, this is the mecca of influencers or what would soon become influencers, right? It didn't exist yet. And um, the last thing we did before we left Boston was work with Allie Raisman. She was in the Olympics. And during the Olympics, women's gymnastics is the most viewed in all the Olympics. Her line of socks crushed it. Did hundreds of thousands of dollars of socks with Allie. And that's coming from zero, right? We right. sold pretty much nothing in college, a couple grand, whatever. Did, got a deal with Ali Raisman. And then Taylor said, dude, we got to move to LA. There's more people like Ali. We can repeat this. So we moved in that building. And that's where we met Logan Paul. And Logan Paul was right on the way up. We moved, the day we moved in was the first day he launched his first blog. Oh, wow. Like that was the timing, you know, pretty crazy. Funny to look back now and think like, right. if you kind of set the stage of where we were before that, we are selling nothing in college, a couple thousand dollars here and there. Then we did Alley, that was a massive campaign. Then Logan. So we're like, oh, we know how to do this now. We don't sell to stores, we just do influencer. But what we didn't realize was we had the two best influencers in the world. There were arguably not many better influencers in the world. You know, Ali Raisman during the Olympics. <laughs> uh, Logan Paul as he starts vlogging for the first time and is just exploding. So we realized we couldn't just replicate what we did at the influencer so we had to look at our business and say what the heck are we doing right and we were selling a ton of socks at the time but we weren't making any money and if you have a business not making any money it's like what are you doing you're just spinning your wheels you know yeah. um, so we were paying everyone and not making any money as a business so we had to reevaluate and somewhere around that time we stumbled into e-commerce we met some guys that were crushing it in e-commerce like jake cassin of movement watches and he kind of opened our eyes to that world and said like look at it through this lens like check out e-commerce look how crazy it can be how powerful it can be um, so that was great so we started getting socks and selling them online and understanding e-commerce the ins and outs of it and what that even meant to sell online and then months later we met ian and developed a relationship with ian from pleek and uh, Ethan also, both of the guys, we started talking about other apparel because we're like, okay, we're selling a ton of socks, it's kind of working, kind of not, it's a little murky. And he's like, oh, what about t-shirts, uh, hoodies, beanies, like these different things. And we started looking at it and we developed this kind of e-commerce thesis, things that we think will work in e-commerce based on kind of a checklist that we've come up with. You know, it's like our internal way of saying, do we think this type of product will work online? And we, we brought that checklist to Ethan and Ian and kind of came into the hoodie category. And we liked it for a lot of reasons, and it was great. How does print on demand fit in the mix of what you guys are doing for e-commerce as an overall strategy? So we like to think about print on demand of how we go from zero to one, right? We have an idea, we think beanies will do really great. I call up Ian, you know, we start designing some beanies, we come out with them, we get it all set up. It requires no cash to set up, and then if they start selling, then, we, then Ian makes them and ships them, that's great. 
Um, and then if it really works, then we scale it, find another way to manufacture, either working with Ian or someone else. But we really think about print on demand as the zero to one, not the long-term solution, but the necessary and like least risky way to start a new idea. So what are some of the tasks that you would recommend brands outsource where they don't have to keep an employee on full time and maybe they can outsource to somebody in a different part of the country like what are some things you can outsource yeah, yeah. and what are some things you should keep in house i think this is this is an easy one for me actually because it i thought about it for so long for probably the last three four years i thought about it and I, I didn't know what the answer was at first i tried to do everything in the house then i outsourced everything and then kind of a mix and what i realized was you have to figure out what your core competencies competencies are and your key advantages are right what are you again going back to like your individual kind of skill sets or assets what are those things those you don't outsource because those are you everything else i'm not good at sewing right i have to outsource that I'm not good at building warehouses. I'm gonna outsource that, right? What are your skill sets that are unique to you that can help you go to the next level? And then what are you not good at? What you're not good at, you gotta get a, a pro for, right? So those are the things you outsource. So when it comes for you guys designing, cause you guys did like, you you designed some hoodies and you did some yeah. like uh, internal prints on them. Tell us about the experience and success of how that did on your guys' overall business. Like uh, how did how did you guys end up transitioning into apparel by doing that? Print and demand enable us to take no cash and try new categories. And as they started to work, we would look at them and think about how do we build a long-term pl uh, plan around this product? Um, and how do we manufacture at scale and take it to the next level? So it's, again, it's just about that zero to one. In terms of design, it was cool because we, we had existing designs from our socks. We were able to pull the hoodies and you can kind of see the evolution of the brand going. It wasn't just like a complete uh, flip of a switch. Right, right. You know, it was kind of like an evolution. And yeah. you know, now you see the stuff we're making, it's very different than feet in 2015. Mm -hmm. you know? What would you say are some challenges that you encountered with print on demand? You know, I think there's a lot of cheap ways to do it and there's different partners out there that can print logos and stuff on t-shirts, but like that's not very unique, that's not very special and it's not your brand. So the difference with these guys and Pleek is they're making stuff from essentially scratch mm -hmm. and when they do that, you know, it's coming out fully branded, uh, fully custom, unique to us, it's like an amazing experience. and you have this amazing product that goes, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. different than just throwing a logo on a t-shirt. Yeah. It's much more than that. You're building a brand with them. So then like, what are some of the challenges that you have as a business though, and maybe scaling the print on demand side and yeah. having to go back to the mass production when you know something works? Scaling the print on demand was almost the easy part because these guys are so good at it. You know, like I never had to worry about shipping stuff. There was always shipped and they took care of it and customers got their stuff and they loved it. Um, I think it was a little bit of a jump going from the print on demand to full production cut and sew. There's a little bit of, of a learning curve there, like there is with anything, but there's no real secret there. It's just, you gotta figure it out. Now let's jump into the four key takeaways from this interview. The first one being that Feet was able to transition into apparel by using a pleek and adding the sock designs into the hoodie liners. What products can you cross over? They use print on demand to go from zero to one. First, proving that their concept would actually work before investing thousands of dollars. Strongly consider partnering with people and suppliers who will help build a brand, not just make you promotional products. Consider creating an influencer campaign to help spread your message in a low cost way. The goal is to gain awareness and convert traffic into customers. So now that you understand the dynamics of operating an e-commerce business, I want to bring you in behind the scenes to meet with Ian, who is the founder of Aplik. We're going to be going over growth strategies as well as ways to increase your profit margins to make your print-on-demand successful. So let's dive into those details. So this is actually one of the hoodies that was developed by Feet by Aplik. So tell us about how they developed this product at a time that they needed the cash. Um, you know, Parker mentioned they were cash strapped and print on demand allowed them to scale into apparel in a way that you know didn't cost them thousands of dollars. So tell us a little bit about the development of this product and how brands watching can also use some of the things that we're gonna talk about right now. Yeah, so one of the most awesome parts of Feet Socks was they had a bunch of these patterns that they were using for uh, their, their main product, which is socks at the time. The hood liner is just a great opportunity to throw a pattern, something that's eye-catching, something that's amazing up in the hood, and just make like a super fun and playful product. And it was just a great fit for the Feet Talks brand. So they just started with a couple samples, took some photos, they ended up on their Instagram, and then it kind of just took off from there. All their customers are like, where do we get one? And so that's how we kind of fell into drop shipping the hoodies for them. One of the challenges in scaling a print on demand type of brand is the margins, right? Yeah. So the printing cost, the fulfillment, you could be in a couple, you know, like the margins are tight, right? So what are some ways that brands watching can think about 
creatively reducing their costs in order to increase that project mar uh, that, that product margin. Yeah, so I mean, you're totally right. Like as you get deeper and deeper into doing drop shipping, you'll find that there can be tightness with margins, right? Even if you take your product costs and you double them and you're getting a 50% margin, you know, you still have a lot of costs to run the business. Maybe you have some customer service expenses or maybe you have some marketing expenses, that type of stuff, influencer marketing. However, you're bringing the eyeballs can bring some expense to the business. So that's what is really kind of special about the Aplique platform. Since we really use fashion as our reference point, we try to take a lot of lessons that the fashion industry at large has learned and apply them to the drop shipping business. You have this hat here, right? So this, yeah. this automatically caught my attention just because of how clean this looks. And if you were to try to do an embroidery like this yeah. anywhere, even if it wasn't print on demand, you're gonna, it's gonna co cost you a couple bucks. But tell us about how this was developed and how the cost was cut on this. Yeah, so this is like a five panel camper hat. It's like a great like outdoors hat. It's kind of on the premium side of a blank hat. I think these drop ship blank for six bucks. And if you wanna add an embroidery, it's like 10 bucks. So it's a $16 product. Um, this actually is not an embroidery, it's an embroidered patch. And embroidered patches are run in mass up front, so you can run 50 of them or 100 of them. But if you know you're gonna sell a lot of hats, uh, the patches could cost anywhere from two to four bucks depending on the size of the patch overall. So this could be like an eight or a $10 hat drop ship instead of a $16 hat. And so every sale, that's just an extra six bucks that you're putting into your pocket. And I think just like one little side note about margins in general, it's not like every single product that you're releasing in your collection has to be a super high margin product, right. but you definitely have to think about your overall collections and make sure you have a few or a handful of products in there that can be really margin killers for you, like just crush on margin. So doing embroidered patches is great. It's a super popular thing for hats. Obviously, everyone understands like an embroidered hat. There's also They're also really good for like outerwear, right? So like this track jacket, this is an independent trading company track jacket. This is an awesome embroidered patch that you can sew onto it. And uh, we can also really help save margins on this product as well. Yeah, because then if they weren't doing this patch, they'd be doing the embroidery. And embroidery, if you guys don't do or don't know, takes takes time, stitch by stitch. Yeah, and then the detail, whereas this patch is simply created, outsourced, right? It's created somewhere else. And then at a pleak, they actually stitch it onto any product. So that saves you a lot of time. It saves them time makes you more money. Just by way of example on this uh, track jacket, so with an embroidered patch, it's 28 bucks out the door. And if you wanna do it as an embroidery, it's more like in the $36 range. So right there, you're saving like about 20% on your cost of goods sold. And it's just a, a, a relatively higher margin product than you could uh, get if you're doing single one-off embroideries. Yeah, and then the, the quality can come yeah, out the, pretty nice, yeah. Exactly, on the quality point, it's like a very similar aesthetic to embroidery. Like it is an embroidered patch, so you have that tech Texture, you have like that sewing detail that's awesome, still super high quality product, and it's just a little bit more of a cost effective way to go about and do things. So when it comes to like cut and sew brands, maybe somebody out there is developing a product or they're mass producing some things and now they're looking to make some decent margins or increase their brand's collection, what are some other ways that they could apply their branding to products here? As we touched on with, um, with Feet Socks, woven labels are just such a fundamental part of branding apparel and even like footwear and other apparel-like segments, right? So like here's a beanie, you can do fun things like, you know, the reverse side of the label. But again, like on the Applique platform, a woven label is a dollar created and sewn into a product. So, I mean, this beanie is a super, super cost-effective product. It's like a $5 cost of goods sold. You can sell these beanies, you know, easily 20 bucks. Yep. So you're making 15 bucks on a beanie. And it's just a really easy way for somebody, like a consumer to get into your brand yep. and feel like they have a piece of the brand. Um, it's something that, and just really cost effective for you to make and Definitely. simple to make. Uh, based on the hundreds or thousands of brands that you guys work with with Applique, what would you say has been some key things that the people watching out there can perhaps implement into their business in order to increase their sales or audience size and really leverage what you guys offer here? Yeah, on the awareness side, I mean, it's just ordering samples, taking really good photos, using those photos in social channels. That's just like a free way to get the message out there versus posting like a mock-up image or something like that. The fact that you've invested in it, you can get a super detailed shot of the product. You can show off your branding like in woven labels and those types of things. That just 
creates a very credible foundation and a trust with uh, consumers. Anytime you can build SEO, like search engine optimization, that's just a way to get a ton of free traffic to your site, so that's really great. Um, and then getting email addresses is, is, is fundamental. So in Shopify, they have like the little spin wheel widget. There's a bunch of email capture tools that you can use. If you can't make a sale, hopefully you can at least get a customer or potential customer's email. And then use like uh, email marketing strategies to bring that person back, to tell your brand story with them, to connect with people. But certainly like if you're spending money on marketing, by far and away one of the highest ROI things you can do is email marketing. And on the Shopify platform, there's a bunch of email marketing plugins that you can use if you're just getting started and get you know 500 or a thousand free contacts um, and just start scaling it out that way and then you're only paying as you you know kind of start tapping into success behind the scenes we're talking about some details with other brands and how sometimes they launch a product and it's not something that makes them a lot of money right like they may have just broken even on the cost or maybe even lost a little bit on that launch but what they got was a lot of leads, right? They got those email addresses. Oh, yeah. Talk to us about the importance of those leads and how somebody could nurture them. Cause I think people watch and think that email's dead, but in reality, it's probably one of the best conversion channels. Oh my God, absolutely, yeah. So what I would say there is just, um, it's like a loss leader, right? You're having a product that you can get out there that a lot of people will buy. Maybe you're just not necessarily making money on that. But the, it's just about instead of, hey, am I profiting there or am I profiting on the lifetime value of that customer? And so that's one of the beauties of doing drop shipping and using Shopify. You're building up your own marketing assets and your marketing infrastructure, which really just comes down to like your email list, your customer list, and being able to go back and re-engage with that audience continually and on an ongoing basis. Because once you can develop a direct relationship with those customers and those consumers, you can get them to come back and, and buy more. So just driving out that lifetime value. The four keys that you need to take away from Ian's interview. The first key being that not every product you create will have high profit margins. Some will be for building your brand's authority. So as you design your collections, think about the high margins that you can create with some products and the loss leaders that you'll have for others. Consider integrating woven labels into your collections to increase the profit margins on staple products such as beanies, hats, and hoodies. Woven labels are a great way to mark up staple items, so make sure you include these into your collection. Think about the lifetime value of your customer versus trying to profit on everything you make. By owning an e-commerce brand, you have the ability to develop a long-term relationship with your customers, so it's not always going to be an upfront profit. Re-engage your audience on a monthly basis with new drops using print-on-demand and the Applique platform. Now, before we end this video, I just wanna go ahead and thank everybody that's watched and is a subscriber to this channel. I really hope that this topic that we covered helps shed some light on the print-on-demand and ways to have success with it. I understand that now more than ever, you need to provide for your family, you need to provide for your business, and I hope that these tips that we shared really help you do that. Now, always remember that you need to find the right product mix and the right target audience in order to have success with it. And it may take some trial and error, so it's important that you start small and scale it up. Now, if you're a new visitor to this channel, consider joining the free online training that we have. And if you'd like us to cover a future topic in a video, then just comment down below so we can get started and working on that. I hope you guys stay safe and everyone has an amazing 2020 because the world and the future really is what we create of it. So I'll see you guys in the next video.